Explore the history, relationships, expertise, and data that go into ensuring Stein growers get maximum yield potential. This is the Stein Seedcast. Here's your host, David Thompson. Hello, I'm David Thompson, National Marketing and Sales Director for Stein Seed Company, and this is the Stein Seedcast, a bi-weekly show where Stein growers, agronomists, and other special guests exchange product knowledge and agronomic expertise. Today, we're visiting with Myron Stein, president of Stein Seed Company. Myron, welcome back. Thank you, David. You know, one of the things I love about our organization is Myron is uh, loves to be out in the country talking with uh, our grower customers, and uh, it's been a busy, uh, busy last few months for you. So, I guess I'm curious, just so you've been out talking to growers, what are growers talking about, and what are you know, the messages you're you're getting from those customers as you talk to them. You know, a big thing that's come up is short statured corn. And at Stein, we have we have worked with shorter statured corn for years and years. Our our genetics have just naturally come out of our breeding program that way. And we have some competitors working on the same material. And it's very exciting to see other companies go down the same path we're going down. And a number of customers are talking about that. They're they're taking note. Um, There's some larger competitors, some very good competitors we have that do a great job with breeding. And uh, so that's that's a fun conversation to have with growers. And it's exciting to see some growers pay attention to the short stature material and and pay attention to the population game, which, which is what we've been talking about for years. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. I think sometimes we've had people who, who say, well, you know, are you upset that other parties are getting in on the game and talking about short stature corn? But really, I think in most cases, we say the opposite's true. I mean, we know it's, we think it's beneficial for growers. And so the more voices out there talking about short stature and high density corn, the better, right? It's, yeah, it's good for the industry. I yeah. mean, of course, we're going to say we have the best products out there, but it's, it's good to have competition in that area. It's good for other companies to be pushing the envelope on corn genetics and getting their corn genetics to handle higher populations. Yeah, so of course, we're looking forward to having those additional voices to the conversation, but it is also interesting to see some of those folks, you know, having some of the same trials and tribulations that maybe we went through 10 or 15, 20 years ago. (laughs) Oh, Oh, yeah. A big thing I've seen is ear placement. You know, as you know, some growers will say, well, I don't want shorter corn because the ear placement's too low. Well, all of our hybrids, we've taken care of those issues. We don't have low ear placement with with our short statured corn. Our competitor does have some issues with that. So it's it's interesting to watch them go through some of the same things that, that we've gone through. Another thing is the, uh, this is not a good word to use. I'm not sure what how else you use it, but the the certain genetics that they're focused on are actually genetics that make smaller plants, smaller plants with smaller root structures. And we've gone down that road before in our breeding program, and we've learned that that just doesn't work very well. Indeed, if you take these these genetics that are naturally short and small, it does make a smaller corn plant, a shorter corn plant. But uh, I think about 10 years ago, we made about 6,000 different hybrids with these type of genetics, and we didn't find one of those that, that was any good. They're all horrible. You know, we've learned a lot in this short statured corn game, but like I said, it's really cool to see other people involved with it in the industry. Yeah, yeah. And of course, short stature, you know, also lends itself into the conversation about higher density planting, higher population. And I think that's what we've got here today. We have an interview you have done Tell us about the grower we're going to hear about today. Yeah, today we're speaking with Jason Mollers, and Jason's in northeast Iowa, and Jason's in uh, Narrow Rose, high population environment across his entire farm. It's a great interview. It's a great great example of somebody else pushing, using super management techniques to push their corn genetics to the next level. Awesome. All right, well, let's have a listen. Hello, we are here today in Northeast Iowa. We're gonna visit with Jason Mullers. On Jason's farm, they use uh, anywhere from, well, the heart of his maturity is 98 to 108, but he does do some 90-day material. He does actually do some 
up to 112 day material. So very excited to see what Jason does on managing his Stein hybrids. Well, Jason, yeah, thanks, thanks for uh, meeting with me here. So tell, you know, tell me a little bit about how you got farming, about your family farm, your situation, you know, what's happened over the years. Well, I got farming basically because uh, we grew up on the farm. Mom and dad were farming. It's always been in the blood. I was actually got out of high school, went to tech school for mechanics, worked for a mechanic for a couple of years. I actually switched to a factory job because it allowed more time to be at home helping the brothers that were running in a partnership. And uh, back in 1988, the one brother bought a farm, the partnership broke up and uh, mom and dad come to me and asked if I wanted to run one of the farms on half and half and uh, so why not? So uh, that's where I got my foot in the door to start. Uh, I actually did all the pencil work, got my FFA books out doing your cash flow and dad asked me when I wanted to do it and I said, uh, I'm not gonna make any money. <laughs> And uh, he literally, which, you know, you're at the age you know so much and dad don't, but uh, he, uh, he says, sat down, he goes, to be honest with you right now, farming is very poor. But if you think down the road, you might want to be full-time farming, I strongly suggest you doing it while you're working because at least if you do go full-time farming, you'll have a bin full of corn or grain or whatever. If you go full-time farming straight out of the gate, having to buy all your grain in Northeast Iowa, you pretty much need livestock to sublet everything else. If you got to buy everything up front, he says, you're going to be so far underwater, you, it's going to be difficult to make it. So although he goes, your profitability in 1988 is really, really bad. He says, if it's your long-term goal to be able to get into it, I suggest doing it. And so that was my first year. It was a drought year, we did not do good, but uh, it got my foot in the door and uh, I've been doing it ever since. Yeah, so, so you started in one of the worst times of, of agriculture and, and, here, and here you are today. And so tell me, what do you enjoy more? Do you enjoy being a mechanic or growing corn? Well, I enjoy both of them. I, I uh, work on a little bit of stuff at home for a few people and work on a lot of our own equipment. Although the technology is getting to the point now that there's stuff you can't do. Sure. But uh, I've always enjoyed the mechanical work, but yeah, you can't beat farming. I says, you got, uh, the only thing that beats is mother nature and uh, nobody can control her. So That's all right. it's changing all the time. The neat thing about farming is every day is just a little bit different, but you're always trying to beat last year. And in the last, Oh, 15 years, uh, I got to know a few other people. Uh, there's actually a group of us on Marco Polo and we're giving a hard time back and forth all the time, but we pay attention to what everybody else is doing, trying to find out what's working for them, what's working for you. It's an actual goal of beating last year. And it's one of those things that gives you the momentum to, to keep going. And you, ne you never have the same year, do you? Oh, you never have the same year. I've. Well, it's been since 88, what, 33 years, and there's never been two years alike yet. So tell me, so uh, you've been growing Stein corn for many years now. Today, what would be your favorite Stein hybrid? Uh, as of today, the portfolio they got for my region, my number one go-to hybrid on bean ground is 9655. Uh, partially because I've been in the 15-inch rows it is one of the hybrids that can handle higher population and it pays. Uh, we've checked it side by side, 30 inch rows versus that, and uh, it goes. I haven't found its top end for uh, stand, uh, but I start limiting just to make sure you're safe for wind damage and stuff like that. So it's my number one go-to hybrid on that. Uh, the corn and corn, there's a few other hybrids I like, 9434-11. Uh, so on 9655, let's, let's talk about that hybrid specifically and let's talk about how you manage that hybrid. So right now, okay, you're going into 2022, you're going into a new planning year. Yield goal, what type of a yield goal do you place on that or how, how do you even develop your yield goal at this point? Well, my yield goal is to try to successfully uh, over a broad area 
pull it, pushing the 300 bushels an acre. I've done it several years in test plots, but uh, I haven't been able to successfully do it across the broad acres. Uh, so I actually learned from a couple other agronomists and stuff like that, take an area, extremely work with that, push that small area to see the maximums rather than trying to push the whole farm because otherwise you might throw a lot of money away. Sure. Okay. So I do a little bit of that. That's why I said I, I like 9655 because it handles the population. It has good yield. It has uh, a pretty good agronomics. Um, you do have to watch with any hybrid pushing a lot of population when it starts slimming down. But uh, my actual ultimate goal is to, I, I should be safe, it, it was the same as years ago, trying to cross 200 bushels an acre. It took me five or six years to actually have a way wagon way out on more than a half an acre, 200 bushels an acre. I know in Illinois, I know other places, there's groups where the 200 bushel club, I couldn't do it. I says, but now, and I talked to a lot of my friends, a lot of people farming, if you're going across the field and you look at the monitor and it's not over 200, you get mad. You're, 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 you're disappointed. It, it, it's, it's, and there's reasons for it, there's no question, but now that you successfully got over that, the next goal is 300. Like I said, I've had several hybrids in test plots over 300. 332 was my top, but trying to find the niche economically to do it. So you can throw the whole kitchen sink at it, but sure. it doesn't do any good to spend $1,500 an acre and get $1,200 back. So, yeah, it's not so, gonna work. So, so, so you're going for 300 bushel corn economically. Now, let's talk about some other details like seed bed preparation. You're, okay, so you're in, you're in 15 inch rows. Yep. Seed bed preparation, anything special you do there? The the uh, seedbed preparation for me isn't different. It depends upon the field. It depends upon the previous crop. It depends upon what I've done prior. What I mean by that is I do a fair amount of no-till corn into bean ground. Mm -hmm. Number one reason for that is we're in the hills, and bean ground is the best thing to grow corn in that I've found other than actually ripping up some alfalfa or some oats. Uh, the bean ground is great to grow corn in, but in my hills, even at no-till, heavy rains like to start ripping the ground up. Mm. So I no-till as much as I can corn into bean ground. Uh, if it's corn on corn, uh, we pump a fair amount of hog manure. My best handling of the hog manure, we, we used to just chisel it in with a drag hose. We, we're doing that, but uh, I found if I actually go in and deep rip it before that, it soaks it in better. It covers up. I, I feel I'm losing less that even though we're stirring it in, we're covering it up, not 100% gets covered up. But after we went to working the ground first, you got three minutes behind you and it's gone. Mm -hmm. It soaks right in. So when I get into ground like that, obviously next spring it's soil finisher. I says to try to keep my bean yields up, uh, it's kind of changing due to fertilizer cost. Next year's gonna change just a little bit again, but I'm actually on a corn, corn, bean rotation. I'm not on a corn, bean rotation. Mm -hmm. Part of it's soil erosion. Part of it's about a third of my acres every year we cover with manure with the drag hose. Mm. So that gets worked. Gets mm -hmm. worked in, handled manure. But I've actually got parts that I do no-till corn on corn. Um, yes, there's particularly a good possibility a 10 bushel hit, but by the time you worked it twice, you're not out a lot. Mm -hmm. The management on corn on corn no-till is a little different. It's a little particular with the planter. I like these guys with high speed planters. I do not do that, no tilling corn and corn. You got too many lumps you're running over. Uh, but the, uh, the management, watching disease, things like that gets a little bit stronger on no till corn on corn. But the uh, probability of it is it's, it's been working. That is not my highest producing ground, but it kind of goes into the flow of what I'm doing. I think the corn, corn beans has given my beans a possibility of a three or four bushel bump. Oh. Sure. I, yep. I can't prove that, but 
going to history with some of the other people. I know guys, corn bean, corn bean, corn beans. Their ground is different. It's not the same as my ground, but there's guys that struggle to get 50, 60 bushel beans. So I, I can't answer, I'm not running it for them, but. And soybeans don't have the, you know, they're not hybrid. They don't have the heterosis to, to fight yep. the disease and everything. Now on singulation at planting, do you really pay attention? I mean, I'm sure it's an important thing for you, but is there anything on singulation? Do you, you run your seed through a test stand or do you just double check it when you're planting? What's your, what do you do there? Well, I try to do the best I can. I, when I went to the 15 inch corn, I went to a John Deere planter. It just seemed like it was gonna fit the seed drop to seed drop because I'm on the contour all the time. That was gonna keep my 15 inch rows more accurate. I wasn't 100% satisfied with their seed drop, so I actually switched it all over to precision. I don't know if it's given me as good a benefit as they claim, but it is more accurate in the field that I've found. Other than that, I'm doing the best I can. It goes down to conditions, field prep. Like I said, I don't plant at seven, eight miles an hour. I've actually got a lot of no-till ground that I'm three and a half to four miles an hour just to try to stop from bouncing and everything else. The next thing that comes to seed space and you have to watch is your vacuum pressure because when you're in 15 inch rows with cells that are basically set to run 30 inch rows, when you're running that much slower on the disc, sometimes you gotta have a little bit more vacuum pressure otherwise you'll actually drop some because they're physically turning slow. Other than that, the planter's been checked over, we've had them on the stand, we, uh, we do the best we can. Now, planning date, which is, you know, we're, we're in Northeast Iowa. What's your optimum planting date for 96.55? I like to do our best to have all corn in the ground by May 5th. Back to Northeast Iowa, two years ago, May 13th was the first corn we put in the ground because we were too wet. I don't believe in pushing the planting date to plant in April if conditions aren't right. If Mother Nature says the conditions are right, this year I think we had all the corn and beans in by May 1st. We go as soon as we can. I plant for my nephew and my brother, as well as myself, and we go to the first field that's fit. Okay. We don't say, hey, you're first, you go there. Uh, we go to the first field that's fit to start and we work, work our way around. Nitrogen application, now this is, so, so you, have, you have manure. That you use. Tell us some on, on that whole, let's assume the 9655 is going on a field with manure on it. Let's assume that. So with tell, us, the, tell us what all you do. With the manure, it, it varies a little bit when we send the sample in, because depending upon if, I have an earth storage pit for my hog buildings. Uh, according to the guidelines of an earth storage pit, you have to empty it twice a year. Well, the limits they make you build it, you don't have any choice, because it it's going to run up. over. When it comes to adjusting the nitrogen, number one is what did it test? If you have a year that you got an extra 10 inches of rainfall during the summer, those catch a lot of water. So your, your nitrogen in your manure actually changes a little bit. Barring any changes in the manure, my fall applied manure, I'll usually add 20 to 25 pounds more of anhydrous on fall applied versus the spring applied just do because you, you got more time, you know you lost a little bit more. Other than that, if I'm on corn and corn, I'm shooting from anywhere from 200 to 250 pounds of nitrogen, taking off whatever I get for manure going from there. Uh, on bean ground, I basically give a pound credit for whatever the yield was. Uh, they say that's not 100% true, but that's what we've done for years. If Again, if I apply some manure on it, I go off of that. But on my bean ground, I'm usually adding 150 to 170 units. Varies, like I said, on what, uh, on what the beans yielded the year before. What about sulfur? Do you put sulfur in with your anhydrous? I, do, I don't put it in the, the anhydrous. I mean, I mean, I put it in the anhydrous, but I mean, do you, do you, do you say, okay, here's, a, here, here's my anhydrous application. I'm gonna count some sulfur for that. I don't do it according to the anhydrous. Uh, I do a little bit. What the soil samples say, again, it goes back to the manure because the amount of manure I pump, I basically cover every acre every third year. Mm -hmm. Again, that kind of comes into the corn, corn, bean rotation. So I, that's three crops. Uh, I cover about a third of my ground every year. 
you get a fair amount of sulfur there. On my other ground, it's been varying. Uh, I've went to very little to some years, I'll push 40 pounds of sulfur. Let's talk about population now. 96.55 on a field, you've, you've got your 250 units of nitrogen on it. What's your population? How, how, do, how do you determine that? And, and maybe walk us through, I'm sure it, it varies from field to field or? It varies from field to field. According to this year, Mother Nature and all the uh, meteorologists had us so scared that we were gonna be the hottest, driest year ever. So I actually dropped an extra two or 3,000 plants per acre because they had me scared. Mm -hmm. Now, as of today, although we were really dry, I, I've got a few fields I wish I had stayed up another two or 3,000 plants per acre. But uh, the 96.55, I still haven't got 100% where the specific is. Of course, Mother Nature throws a wrench in there all the time. But if I'm comfortable that they're talking reasonable moisture, not excessive heat, that is a number that some years I'll push 48,000 yeah. plants per acre. Wow. The safer years, I'm at the 41 to 44. Um, I've kind of been feeling that 40 to 44 range is uh, trying to let the ear flex, trying to do a few things like that, doing the best I can. Again, it comes down to economics. If we got high priced corn to sell next year, if that extra 4,000 plants per acre gives me another 10 bushels an acre, it pays. If we're at $3 corn, now your whole equation changes. That's, that's why when you ask, where's my specific population is, you got a whole lot of things that you throw in there. And sure. Sure. Once the planter hits, all of a sudden this and this and this adds up, this is kind of where I'm at. But I got about a four or 5,000 plant population window I'm in. Still, still a big art, still a big art. Fungicides, insecticides. That's been a topic of uh, variability for quite a few years. Um, when we first started using, I was still in 30 inch rows and uh, I had the guy come in and we flew crossways, across the test plot. That year, every single hybrid had a bump. The top one was 25 or 27 bushels an acre. Not all of them were, some of them were only six or seven bushels an acre. Since I went to 15 inch rows, I watch it closer. Um, I have the, the, the agronomist and the uh, places I'm buying my products from, uh, basically one phone, phone call away to, are you gonna do it, aren't you gonna do it? Uh, I walk my fields a lot, and if I see some rubbing on leaves because you're closer together, if you're seeing some open sores and the probability that it looks like you could catch, it bumps me up a little bit higher on the fungicide application. Um, but over the last five or six years, most of our acres, even before we went to 15, were getting the fungicide because we've been seeing enough bump to cover it. But once again, that's one of those things that $3 corn versus $5 corn, if you're talking 10 bushel an acre yield bump, that's 50 bucks yeah. versus $30. $30, if that's all you're gonna get out of it, it's a wash. Uh, it, it, it isn't worth your time. So it's, it varies every day. Well, Jason, thank you very much for, for sharing how you do super management of your Stein hybrids. You're in that high population arena. You're walking the fields every day, correct? Pretty much. Well. There's very few days that I don't walk out there somewhere and see what's happening. So you're so you're not you're not scouting from your from your pickup window. You're actually walking into the field and checking them out. So thank you for sharing that information. It was excellent to hear that. I hope hope the viewers take something from that on how to manage uh, high population corn. Thank you for having me. So that was Jason Molers from Northeast Iowa. Really great interview. Another one of what, you know, I think Myron, you've coined as a super management type of, of grower. Some of the things I heard in there, narrow rows, high population, uh, which we know requires a lot of management, a lot of paying attention to detail. And I think that he talked about some of those things in that interview. So very interesting. Yeah, he, you know, he, he's somebody, he loves 9655G. He likes 9434-11, 9655 specifically. He has learned how to push that hybrid, 
he hasn't reached the pinnacle of what what he can do with 9655, but that's probably the most productive hybrid on his farm. The increased populations paying for him, you know, he he sees the, the economical benefits of it. You know, his goals are 300 bushel corn. That's what he's going for. He, you know, he came up and said, "Okay, I've I've at one time my goal was 200 bushel corn. I've reached that. I've moved it up to 300 bushel corn. I went 300 bushel corn in a in a broad area. Uh, that's wonderful to see. He understands his farm." really, really well. He, he knows each field very, very well. And I think that's a key too, in being meticulous and understanding, okay, this field, I might need 40,000 plants. This field, I can put it in at 45,000 plants and so on and so forth. Yeah. And I noticed, uh, I think at one point mentioned up to 48,000 plants per acre. So yeah. even in the world of Stein, that's, that's someone who's really pushing the envelope, but it sounds like he's doing it only under the most particular of circumstances. Yeah, exactly. We, we would probably not advise having <laughs> 48,000 plants out there. We've done that before, but he knows. He, he knows what field he can do that on, and that's the trick. There's no silver bullet with managing uh, these, these high-management hybrids. One of the other things I heard him talk about was fungicide application, and that seems to be a common thread that I've heard throughout, you know, some of the interviews you've done with, with these um, – super management type growers. So uh, is that just something that that is coming on strong with that group? I mean, is there a school of thought there about fungicide that they all seem to share? They all recognize you have to have fungicide. If you have more plants out there, you know, there's less air movement in the plants. The theory is there's less air movement, so there may be more susceptible to fungicide or to fungal issues, but everybody does it. So every grower I've talked to that's that's doing super management of corn, they're doing fungicide. And it's interesting not to get on this subject, but you know, there's a number of growers now doing fungicide on soybeans. Mm-hmm. So fungicide is just a nice insurance policy. Um, a lot of different people can find different costs in fungicide. You, know, you, you can buy generic, very inexpensive fungicides, which frankly, at the end of the day, I think are, it's a good thing to look into. You can do the more expensive stuff, but everybody's doing something. Okay. Kind of like Jason said at the end of the interview, you know, uh, the other factor there is what your end gate price is, right? What, what, you're, what are you getting per yeah. bushel? Yeah. And maybe when prices are better, all of these things, you're looking to maximize every single bushel you get. And so fungicide maybe is a topic of conversation where maybe it wouldn't have been, you know, previously. And many times they bring up application of that. So if you have tall corn, you're stuck to flying that on. Oh. If you have shorter statured material, some people are striving to get something in their field where they can drive a machine over the top of it. And so the shorter statured stuff lets you do that in some cases. Now you, you talked about, you know, Jason had particular hybrids that he really was keen on from our lineup. I guess, tell me a little bit about, you know, you said he knows his, his farm, he knows his acres. I mean, what are the things that those that growers like Jason are looking at when they say, I've, I've really looked at this hybrid and it fits my farm. You know, what are those characteristics that they're looking to put the puzzle, puzzle pieces together on? Well, in the case with him, it's 9655-G, which would be considered his racehorse, highly productive, non-corn on corn ground. He, you know, he, he wants this to be on something that had soybeans the previous year. And then he has 9434-11, which has uh, some below ground insect protection. He puts that on his corn, corn on corn ground. I mean, that, so he's looking at traits. He's looking at traits and then some genetics, but okay. mostly traits. Okay. Another thing I heard him mention in the interview it, it, that I think was interesting was he mentioned that he's kind of anxiously waiting for the next new hybrid. And I think that's an interesting notion among, because in our industry, I think a lot of times people get fixated, right, on, on a number. This is my favorite number. I love this number, and I hope you never get rid of this. Um but I was interested to hear him say, you know, hey, I, I want, I want the next thing coming. Oh yeah, yeah. He 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 definitely wants new material constantly. So he he wants to stay up on that, you know, on the newest genetics that you're you're bringing out because he recognizes that's where yield comes from. He does not stand still when it comes down to that. You know, the other thing, obviously, not every grower deals with manure application, but it's a big part of Jason's operation. And it affects his fertility program. It affects, uh, I think, in, in the interview, talked about how it interacts with 
sulfur because sulfur is another common topic among our super management uh, growers here. And I think that's, again, just another wrinkle for an operator like Jason that, that maybe folks who aren't in the livestock business don't have to deal with. Oh, yeah. And that's and I know very little about that. So it was interesting to talk to him about that. And obviously, it sounds like it's a moving target for for the added nitrogen he has to to bring for those fields. Well, that's great. Uh, for those who tuned in, we've been talking with Myron Stein about his uh, visit with Jason Moller's, a grower in northeast Iowa. Myron, thank you for joining us again today. Thank you, David. So we'll be back again in two weeks with another episode of Stein Seacast. To make sure you never miss an episode, we suggest you subscribe to the Stein Seacast wherever podcasts are found. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll talk to you next time. To learn more about Stein and its elite corn and soybean genetics, visit steinseed.com. Subscribe to the Stein Seedcast wherever podcasts are found. Stein has yield.